shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Health and Wealth Podcast with your hosts, Tim and Carter. What's trending in Richards? Carter Wilcoxon, founder of CSI Financial Group here with my co-host and former wealth advisor, Tim James, founder of chemicalfreebody.com and your new health advisor. This is the show where we reveal the connection between physical and financial abundance. Hey, welcome back in Richards. Carter Wilcoxon here coming to you live during the Phoenix Open Week, which uh, if anybody out there has listened to any of our podcasts before, you know that I'm obviously here in Phoenix, Arizona. We're actually hosting an event tomorrow at the Phoenix Open on number 16. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that. But uh, I am joined here with my esteemed co-host, Mr. Tim James, Mr. Chemical Free Body himself. Tim James, how are you, my man? I'm doing good, brother. It's funny because I I recorded an episode of my podcast right before this, the Health Hero Show, and the guy I had on was a personal trainer, comma golfer. And when it said that, I, I went into this whole thing about you for like five minutes. <laughs> I, I was like, we have the Health and Wealth podcast, and I was like, if I mentioned this on here before, I was like, if I haven't, guys, it's the Health and Wealth podcast. Check it out. But um, you know, uh, my my co-host Carter is always talking about golf, and we've actually had some some golf pros on professional golf players on stuff like that. So anyway, I just thought that was hilarious because, um, and then here you are and you're talking about golf right out of the gate again. So right, I, think right. you like, I think you like golf, dude. I, that's been my conclusion. Yeah. Right on cue. Well, you know, golf literally uh, changed the, to use a golf term trajectory of my life. So uh, I I'm, I'm definitely a, a huge fan of golf and, and uh, involved in it too. Very much so. Yep. An aspiring golfer. He's uh, he just turned 15, um, you know, last week, actually. In fact, a week ago today. And uh, he is out there on what's that? He's a sweet kid. I I remember when we FaceTimed that one time or some video you shot and he was he's just like a present or something. He came up and hugged you and I could tell you have a really cool family, brother. Yeah, th- thanks. It's uh, it's very important to me to, to have a, a great family. But golf is what got me to Phoenix, Arizona in the first place. And they call it the, the the greatest show on grass, right, is the Phoenix Open, Waste Management Phoenix Open, because it's a, it's a big party that goes on out here. So, uh, uh, you and Richards, if you are listening and you know anything about the Waste Management Phoenix Open, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But um, it just happens to coincide with this week that we're doing this recording. But I am excited about our guest that we have here today, Trishal Patel, um, coming all the way in from... New York, is that right? Or is that just where you're from? Well, that, that's just where I'm from. And I like to think of myself as being pretty mobile. But at the moment, I'm in Florida. That's where I am now. Oh, okay. All right. And I so, look it up, dude. He's down in West Palm, which is yep. just kind of cool because the whole Health and Wealth podcast wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for my journey to West Palm Beach. That's where the Hippocrates Health Institute is. So it's off of Skis Road. You know where Skis okay. Road is? You could no, I, I don't know that road. Yeah, dude, you're gonna have to go over there and just have lunch. You can just show up and it's like 20, 25 bucks, and you can you can have lunch and it's this big, huge living food buffet, like sprouted, everything's like sprouted, and it's it's pretty good. They have these um amazing chefs and stuff there, and um it's it's pretty cool. So um I hope you get a chance, um uh Trishel to go down there and uh, and check it out. Yeah, awesome. Looking forward to that. Yeah, awesome. Okay, well, well, the good news is um, I can still hear you, but for some reason, I don't know if something happened to your your oh, background. It's, it's, it's just spooling. Yeah, I just I, I've never had that happen before. So anyway, the good news is, in Richards, you're probably listening to this while you're cleaning the house or driving to um, a cross country or on a plane, traveling to some sort of conference or whatever. But uh, let's go ahead and jump into this, Trisha, if you don't mind. Let's let's go in the uh, in the way way back machine, if you will, and uh, share with the enrichers our audience on uh, what was it that got you into the financial services business in the first place. And I, I know that we're going to talk a little bit in the second segment about your own podcast that you got and everything. But but I want to hear and the enrichers want to hear what was it that influenced you to go down the route of uh, of the financial services business. You know, to be frank, it just started off with I graduated with an undergrad and master's in computer science, and I was just looking for a job. And I happened to land in a financial services com- company. 
and it was a consulting company. We were building software for banks. So it wasn't really knee deep in finance, but it was enough to kind of get my feet wet. But, you know, at the same time, this was pretty early on in the 2000s. And a lot of things were happening in my life where I had money for the first time. You know, I was getting a solid paycheck where I could have some extra money to invest. So that's actually what drew me into the investing side of financial services. And I started putting money to work in the market and learning about stocks and how to pick stocks and stuff like that. My original investment philosophy was like long only, buy and hold, kind of Warren Buffett style. So that really got me thinking about how to value companies. And then I really started getting into it from my own passions of figuring out what to do with my life. And I really liked the investment journey itself. So that's how I started, but it, it definitely went pretty far from there from where I began into the whole space of investment management. And that's where I landed, you know, further down in my career. Gotcha. So, um, well, then, then let's go back. And uh, since it since it was fairly recent that you got into the business, you know, what was it like you you mentioned in the in the pre-show that you're from New York, from from upstate New York and everything. So uh, and, and now you're in Florida, which I believe is like the number one place for retirees to go from New York is to Florida. Uh, you're a young guy, so uh, nowhere close to retirement unless maybe you're doing a lot better than I thought. But you are young as far as like retirement age goes. So so what was it like, in, you know, in New York and, and growing up in that area? Um, you know, for yourself? And, and did you see any signs that that maybe investing or getting into the like money or whatever, that there were certain things that, uh, that predated where you're at now? Yeah, so the, the way it kind of happened, again, this is always kind of organic, you don't really plan out this, but I got into investing, and I liked it so much that I went to business school to get my MBA, got an MBA in finance. And my hedge fund internship was with a hedge fund that's been around for a very long time. It was actually jump-started by Warren Buffett's former partners. And it was a fund that carried that type of long-only legacy for the last like 50 years or so. So very high-performing fund and they did well. And it gave me an inside view on, okay, how do the best of the best value companies? And then from there, I also started tying my engineering background to investing. And what this meant is I had this quantitative idea about how to price different instruments and come up with market uncertainties. So I started tying together investing and quantitative finance, building my own models. And that actually took me to the other side of the world. So I started pitching my ideas to anybody who would listen. And I got on the radar of a options trading firm in Southeast Asia. So I ended up in Malaysia for a couple of years after business school. So again, not even close to Florida at this point, probably a 180 from there. And I was in charge of managing the options book for this firm, meaning we're the sole revenue driver of the company. Did really well out there, but it really opened my eyes to a global market. And what that means is we were pricing these derivatives on commodities, stocks, currencies, indices, you know, whatever we could build a model on, we could price and sell. And that really gave me a great opportunity to realize there's a lot more going on than, you know, just New York. And of course, a lot more going on in the markets than just the U.S. markets. Gotcha. So um, so I, I, I know that I, I see that you uh, went to Cornell. Is that where you got your MBA? Is that right? Yeah, I, I have an undergrad and my master's in computer science and an MBA from Cornell. OK, so um, is that is that considered a hat trick? <laughs> it is in Cornell terms. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, so prior to that, right? Like, like I, I want to talk about like, you know, high school, you know, maybe grade school. Was that all growing up in New York? Was that, um, you know, where you were at the whole time until you said you went to Malaysia and then ultimately landed in Florida? Pretty well, I'd say the Northeast. So that consulting gig was in New Jersey after I graduated from my first master's degree. So still Northeast, but you know, once I went back to business school, I kind of wanted a warmer climate. So that's what kind of geared my job search outside of the Northeast. Gotcha. Um, so you know what brutal winters are like then in New York, obviously. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that you didn't you didn't want to do that any longer if you if you could uh, if you could help it. So 
So walk me through a little bit about what it was like in, um, you know, in, in grade school, junior high and high school that, um, you know, what were some of the things that really interested you that had nothing to do with the financial services business? Then? You know, I'd say academically, th things were kind of OK in terms of the sciences and the math stuff. I was def definitely had this engineering mind and that really tied back to my interests outside of school. So I was one of those kids who built their own computers, right? Stuff like that. I started off with computers when, you know, I was like nine or 10 years old. And this was the point where computers, they didn't even have hard drives, right? You got to load up those big floppy disks and you have that green monitor, you know, the green and black typing that you see in like in the matrix. And it just gave me a ground view of seeing all of this technology built up from the start, you know, from the ground up. And, you know, went from there to internet, you know, the dial-up modems and all of that, and then finally getting broadband. It was a, a pretty neat journey to see all that come about. Yeah, so, you, so you've always, like, had this engineering mind then, right? So, you know, your, your guidance counselor, if you can remember this, right, like, like what was the, um, the, the emphasis to, I guess, land on Cornell, right, because you probably had other options or whatever, and you decided Cornell – for a reason, but I'm just wondering as you're, as you're going through and, you know, getting ready to graduate, then you're going to go on to bigger and better things from high school. You know, did you have any type of an influence from your guidance counselor being like, Oh, that makes all the sense in the world. Or was there a, a, a time in your life where you weren't quite sure where you were going to go? So, you know, the, the path that I may have been starting out early on in my high school career was probably like biology pre-med. And that, that's just something that's pretty common with my family. But I did transition towards engineering towards the end of high school. And again, it was just this timing where you can imagine late 90s, early 2000s. This is the dot com boom, right? The Internet is coming up and a lot of programming jobs are all over the place. And it's a really nascent field. But Again, this is at the tipping point, you know, late 90s is when it really took off. But graduating in 1998, you could kind of see the writing on the wall at that time. Yeah. So we had the dot com bust and everything. So that uh, that was interesting. So did you ever at, at some point during, um, you know, the, the next phase of schooling, did you ever think to yourself Silicon Valley or, you know, Stanford or anything like that? You know, I kind of did. But it, here's how it kind of played out. And it, Whoever knows why things happen this way, but just as I was graduating or the year before I was graduating, year 2001, basically you could get a job in the IT space or the tech space by just having the word computer on your resume. Right? You could get a, you know, like a startup bonus and they would hand you like keys to a car and all of that. But everything changed in 2002 when I actually did graduate. Uh, you know, that was right after the bust and a lot of those jobs disappeared. So frankly, what I ended up doing is staying back a year for my master's. And that's why I went straight into a master's program right after I graduated with the undergrad program at Cornell. Wow. Gotcha. So so Cornell was pretty much your main choice from the from the get then. It, it, it was, uh, you know, growing up in upstate New York, that, that was also not too far away from where I grew up in um, maybe two or three hours drive from home. So it had that local appeal. But, you know, also good engineering school, no, no issues there as well. And also it gave me an opportunity if I wanted to jump back into the, the biology side of things. It, it also has a good program in that. So um, a, a lot of the, the common theme that I here and I see from a lot of our other guests that come on here is that, you know, they just, they actually have a, a heart for like trying to help people, right? Like, like you're like, I know I can help people by doing, you know, this, whatever this might be in the financial services. Um, is, is there a little bit of that same mentality in your mind? Like, you know, build a better mousetrap, so to speak with your engineering brain. I think so. So when it comes to even what I'm doing now with my business, it's always about what can I do slightly better? What can I kind of optimize? And this kind of mindset I've brought through my entire career has always been, okay, you know, what's the next best thing to do and what can we do slightly better? And frankly, that's translated into my personal life as well. You know, when it comes to health and wellness and figuring out what other ways that I can 
make small adjustments in my life. It's always been this engineering mentality of, okay, let's try this small thing next. Let's run a few, you know, real life tests. And if it works, let's go in that direction. So it, it's definitely been helpful, not only in my career, but my personal life, my job, and even my current position as a independent financial advisor. So um, I also see, speaking of that, um, you have uh, a, a family. Do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, the the importance of, uh, you know, the role that your your wife plays? And, and I see you've got a daughter. I don't know if you needed to update this, if you've got, if you've got more kids in that or not from the time this was bit written. But um, how, what type of a role and an importance do you does, do you see your family playing in your aspirations? Yeah, it, it's a very important role to me because at the end of the day, I, I really like the idea of not working to live uh, or living to work. I like to put my life ahead of my career, frankly. And what gives me the most happiness is, frankly, the ability to spend that time with my family. What actually ended up happening is when my daughter was born, I really had to rethink my career path and understand what was really important in my life. And it actually happened at a time where I realized I could be financially independent pretty soon after that point. So I did end up giving up the hedge fund career in my late 30s to transition to to what I'm doing today. So definitely quality of life is a key component for you is what, is what you're saying. Yeah. And, you know, I, I certainly could have been on that that track that I that brought me to Florida for much longer. But what I started to realize is, you know, what's kind of happened with my family over many generations is that you kind of just have to work very hard until the very end to kind of get things going and make ends meet. But I, I had this mentality of, you know, saving as much as possible, being very aggressive with my um, ability to put money away and make it work for me. And I was able to put that mindset to the test by frankly, just having a sabbatical in, in my late thirties and saying, okay, let me really refocus my life to what I feel matters the most. And that that's being able to spend as much time with my family as I, I thought would be sensible. That's awesome, that's awesome, dude. I, I really, it's funny. I was having, who was I talking to? I was having a conversation with, Oh, um, Jason Payne. Um, he owns organics bed, dot com with an x organics with an x bed.com it's the best freaking beds ever like literally but um i i have to get a new i was telling you guys i'm moving right back home to eastern oregon and i'm going to be building on my parents property and i need a trailer I, I i bought a trailer and my i bought this big king mattress and it, it won't it only takes a queen so i have to i called him up to get a new one and jason and i got into this deep conversation um trishel and we were talking about you know business and work work life and that balance and stuff and i told him i said hey man our business is here for one reason it's here to support our personal life our personal life is not here to support our business and we really he that really resonated with him and he's like tim i think you're in my top 10 of people <laughs> that i know now so because it's like we get so caught up as entrepreneurs business people sales people financial advisors whatever you're doing sometimes we get so caught up in our life coming from one form of abundance, that being financial abundance, that we forget about all these other ways that abundance can come to us. So I think it's really important what you did. And you taking a sabbatical, just pausing for a moment out of the rat race to really think about what's important to you and regroup, probably some of the best. Um, I, hope the, I, hope, I hope the enrichers are taking notes here. These are two powerful takeaways that he's given you right here. Pause for a moment, reflect and and reset if you're not on the right traje trajectory if we're going to use that word that uh, carter used earlier of nice. where you yeah if you where you want to go we'll get the golfers involved um <laughs> and, and reset your life and understand that your business is yeah it's awesome it's important it's your career it's fun you're helping lots of people but it's it's there for a reason it's there to support your personal life so i just really commend you for that brother thanks tim i i appreciate that and to, to be honest a little bit of that had to do with burnout you, you know i i was on that track where you know just ascending that that ladder as quickly as i can working as hard as possible but things change when when you start building out that family and you you have a kid and you realize well you know what is this all for what what's the yeah. purpose of all this 
Yeah, you just kind of slowly get, I don't know, you get slow walked into it because everybody else is doing it. Before too long, you got the wife, the kid, mortgage, you got all these bills, and you're like on the hamster wheel going, what, what's the what's the point of all this? Like, you know, there's nothing wrong with the family. I mean, I get the point of that. That's that's the good stuff, but it's like, you know, is this really what I want to do, right? So, all right. Yeah. anyway, we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, we will get into what Trishel is all about, what he's doing in his, his financial practice as a certified financial planner. We'll be right back. Estate planning. What does that even mean? When the inevitable happens for everyone on this planet, your estate plan kicks into action. But first, let's start with what an estate is. An estate is simply everything you own. Now, here's the issue and what needs to be understood when this event occurs. You only have two choices on this plan. Number one, either you plan how your estate gets handed out and distributed to those you leave behind. Or number two, your state decides who gets everything you own. For the first time ever, you can now take complete and total control of this plan that you've been deprived of for most of your life and generations before you. You can get personalized assistance along the way with a team of specialists whose job it is to make sure you have true peace of mind. It's important to understand that estate planning is a journey and rest assured that our team will be available to you all along the way and at every step. Welcome to eState Plan, home of the last estate plan you'll ever need. To learn more, make sure to reach out to your local advisor licensed with us or go to our website for more information. What's up, Enrichers? Tim James here with my co-host Carter Wilcoxon. Today in the house, we've got Trishel Patel, Certified Financial Planner and Advisor. Um, Trishel, I was just commending you on these two very important things. You know, a lot of times we come on here and we're talking, which we're going to do in this segment. We're going to talk about like what you're doing in your practice, how you're helping your clients. Um, I don't know if you're working with um, with Epic Services uh, or not, but you, you just brought up something that I think it really – we should talk about really just touch on again, which is the business supports the personal life. So advisors out there, people listening that are not advisors, just, you know, um, I would say the general public, but I guess we're, we're, all, we're all general public, right? But the business is supposed to support our personal life. And if you are not happy with where you're at right now, I think what Patel did or with uh, Trishol did, Tr Trishol did, uh, Trishul Patel did, which is very powerful, is he took a sabbatical to reflect on his life, and it it charted a whole new course for him. And I can tell it's it worked really well. So anyway, with that said, Trishul, why don't you get into like what you're doing now in your practice um, to help people uh, in your local area? Yeah, so uh, I actually serve people locally and across the country. I'm virtual, so 100% virtual. That means I designed the business so that I would have the freedom to kind of be anywhere I want to be and still be able to do this. So I mentioned the sabbatical and the sabbatical began with the notion of, frankly, I had no idea what I wanted to do. But over time, I just started realizing I have all this financial knowledge. So I started writing a blog and then I, I got the podcast going. I have a podcast, mindmoneyspectrum.com. Just a long form conversation about what I, what do I think about finance and money and how does it impact how we live our lives? And started helping friends and family because I realized a lot of people in my family were kind of getting the worst financial advice that out there. And from there, that, that's where the business grew. So I, I mentioned I, I was able to take the sabbatical in my late 30s. And the notion there was I'd reached a a point where I was kind of financially independent. I could live off my investments. And with the business, I help my clients reach financial independence sooner rather than later, just kind of doing a lot of the stuff that I did in my personal life, but also making sure that the investments are doing what they should be doing from that perspective. So that, that's what I do in the business. I, I wake up every day to help my clients do the best that they can to reach that level of financial independence sooner rather than later. And, and working with those types of clients typically means that it's somebody in your 30s or 40s where you have a high amount of income, you're a high performing 
individual or part of a family that has a good amount of income, but you want to put it to work in the most sensible way possible. You know, accelerate the, the savings rates. That's very important. And then putting that those investments to work as efficiently as possible. You know, you mentioned so, something yeah. earlier uh, that rang true to me. Like you, you said, oh, what was the word? It was like, a, it was, I don't know if it was aggressive, but you said you were aggressively saving, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. I don't know if the word was aggressive, yeah. but um, that reminded me of uh, Rick Ruby, who is uh, one of the coaches at the core training. And, and the goal that they taught us was to be able to save 30% of your income. That was mm -hmm. the goal. And mm -hmm. I don't care who you are. If you can work and get set up so you're at that goal, you're going to, as long as you're a steward with your money, you got somebody like a Trishol to help you, you're going to retire pretty wealthy and you're going to be able to do what you want when you want to do it with whom you want to do it with. Um, and you could be a driver for UPS. I mean, there was like that one guy, remember that one guy that was a UPS driver and he had like 65 million bucks when he retired and he never made more than like 35 grand a year. He just put a huge, I think it was something like that. He put like 30, 40, 50% of his income away. He just was an aggressive saver. That one little tactic right there is so powerful, so powerful. Anyway, I thought I'd bring that up. I just, I've, you've, you've brought up quite a few good things in my mind in this podcast already. That's a very excellent point, Tim. So there's really two key things. The, the more you save, the sooner you can reach financial independence. And if you're going to be saving, you might as well invest as sensibly as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, Trisha, I'm curious then, cause you said, you know, 30 or 40, but you're, you're all over the country that you, um, how do your new clients find you? Are you, are you primarily doing something, uh, word of mouth or is it something that you're doing as far as like marketing is concerned or, and where, you know, are some of your clients at, obviously you're in Florida now, right? We got that figured out that you, and, and how long you been in Florida? Uh, about a year now, but I, I was there um, with my previous career as with the hedge fund down here. Gotcha. Gotcha. So um, then anyway, but back to my, my question, you know, what does the demographic look like and how are you acquiring, you know, new clients primarily? So my, my clients tend to be spread out along the eastern seaboard, so northeast and south, southeast for whatever reason. Uh, but, you know, they are spreading out over the country slowly in terms of, I see that in my prospect flow. I think initially, you know, just like any business, it started off with networking and relationships like friends and family and stuff like that. But I did start the podcast and the blog, you know, like about a year or two ago, I'm about over a hundred episodes in on the podcast now. And it is kind of resonating. It's getting the message out there. And Beyond that, I have the niche of, you know, helping people in their like 30s or 40s reach financial independence sooner rather than later. And I think that does resonate with the type of prospect flow I'm seeing. So if they're searching for those types of things and I'm showing up in those types of searches, I think that's that's working. That's awesome. So um, so then are you getting a lot of traffic driven to your website? that that's where they're they're sort of finding you then filling out the contact us form or something like that then is that what you're saying it is so you know kind of with you know search engine optimization and things like that having the separate entity the podcast it's not under my original domain of investing at forever.com which is my business the podcast is mymoneyspectrum.com it basically takes it creates a presence in two separate places on the internet that kind of talk to each other so that kind of increases my expertise in the mind of the search engines, right? It just has multiple points showing that I, I'm directed towards, you know, this type of, of service for these types of people. And then, you know, at the same time, I, I have contributed to other third party sources like articles and, and whatnot. And that's also increased my visibility. So I think, you know, a combination of those things, when I first started the business, and I started the podcast, frankly, I heard from other advisors where if you get something like this going for a couple of years that, you know, I one advisor had mentioned that ended up being his sole source of marketing, just having that out there. And it's a great source because it allows clients or prospects to really dig into who I am and what I think and how I approach all these different types of problems so that they can self-select themselves. 
and they get a really strong idea before they even pick up the call. Meaning if they're reaching out to me, they have a pretty good idea of what I'm all about. Yeah, that that's awesome. So, so do you want to talk a little bit about the acronym that you call FIRE? Um, and, and, you know, what, you know, what a uh, perspective or a current client may be, uh, you know, how they're utilizing that to, um, you know, to have a brighter future, I guess. Right. So, you know, FIRE is a movement that predates me or predates my involvement with, with the business. And the notion is financial independence, retire early. And it's pretty much what I've been saying, the notion that if you save more, you can speed up your time to retirement. And, you know, Tim, you had mentioned that 30% rate. Yeah. If you kick that up, you know, the average American house is a, a few percent a year. And what that means is they got to work till they're 70, even not more, you know. But if you get that up to like 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, you, it's just exponential at that point. If you yeah. pass, you know, a, a certain threshold and you don't increase your your expenses as your income goes up, you can really shave off those years. It's scary. I mean, we have like it's something stupid. It's in the low 70 range, but like 70 percent of people in the United States have less than four hundred dollars in savings. OK, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things working against you, but one of them is is um, is yourself, you know, and maybe feeling self-defeated and thinking you can't get out of it. So and this is why it's so important to get somebody that, that does this all day long. This is what they do. Right. Like when people come to us, they're usually coming to when they come talk to me because they want to get their health out then because that's all I do all day long. Been doing it for 11 years, healed myself, you know, that kind of stuff. So you want to work with a financial advisor that works on helping people save money all day long and putting it away so you don't lose it. You know, never invest thy principal where or thy money where thy principal is not safe. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's such a powerful concept. Like you don't have to make that much money. And you can retire pretty wealthy if, if you become a steward with your money. You know, one thing that's interesting, guys, that I always notice is that people that are that are um, religious that tithe. They have they have more money on average than my other financial clients that I had when I was a financial advisor. I saw that and they and they already gave up 10 percent of their income. Mm -hmm. So how's that? How they're giving away 10 percent. What is that? So I know there's like this universal law what you put out is what you get back that's why you know i have a, a charity box and my, my, my business i actually have a business savings account attached to my business sa checking so i have my business tax savings account i've got um a long-term investing fund that i put money in there for for land purchase and then i also have a charity account and there's some there's there's a power to that but these people are already got 90 they're living on 90 percent, and they're saving more than people that have 100 percent right so it's there don't don't get caught up in the minutia that you can't do this you just might need to readjust some things even if you're kind of stuck right now or you feel stuck because you got the big mortgage or whatever in the car payment and and because the last car broke down and you had to refinance it and bury that you know yourself into the next car and you got this high car payment, whatever there's there's always a way out if you stay focused and you're on if you have a plan and then you stick to the plan that's why financial planning is so important well, yeah, and, and working with someone like, uh, you know, Trishel, who is a CFP, who has, uh, you know, MBA. I mean, you're, you're the, the brain that you have that you bring as a financial planner uh, is, is powerful. And, and that's why I'm not, I'm not surprised that, you know, you probably get a lot of uh, clients that come working with you that, you know, from referrals or introductions, uh, I, I would venture a guess because of, you know, that capability that you have to be able to help them out because they're, you know, they're not uh, involved in, you know, financial planning every day, day in and day out. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, Tim, you're, you, you've got this background that you're using for our podcast today. And I see all these trees, right? What's the old saying of the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best day is today, right? Mm -hmm. So investing is much in the same way. Wouldn't you imagine uh, that to be true? Trishel? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I did an episode on what's the best advice for someone in their 20s? Save more, you know, just keep it simple. If you just have that consistency of saying this amount of my paycheck goes into Y bucket and you just do that month in, month out, that's a good part of the journey of getting there, right? And, you know, Tim, you made some good points about just, you know, people who tithe have the ability to do it, but, you know, why can't everybody else? It, it's so true. It's really not how much you earn. It's how much you save. Mm -hmm. yeah, Living below so, your means. Is it a want 
or is it a need? If you really stop and ask yeah. yourself before you buy something, you'll find out probably nine times out of 10, it's a one, it's not a need. It's an mm -hmm. emotional trust. There are marketers out there that are damn good and they're going to take your money. I actually went mm -hmm. to a marketing course and this guy, he basically got up front and he was an old school marketer and he was really good at it. He's like, well, basically what we do is we just kind of, we reach into your pocket and we take your money. And that's basically what he said. And then he wasn't like, like, you know, BS. around the bush at all he was that's pretty much what we do now he said no it's kind of like a superpower so when we teach you this stuff you want to do do good with it you don't want to you know be like just selling people crappy products or services and stuff like that but there's marketers out there that are so damn good they know the words and the sentences and how you think and the feelings and they're able to put that down on paper or into an ad or something like that and it just resonates with you and you're, they're, they're just, you're pulling out your you're pulling out your checkbook you're pulling out that credit card and it's really easy to do. And now online, you know, there's things called upsells and downsells. So you, everybody knows this, like Amazon started this, you buy a product and it says like, Hey, other people that bought this product, like this, this, and this, like if you bought like a, like maybe you started a podcast and you bought like a, a mic, right. And it's like, Oh, you need the damp, the damper thing for the, or you might need a, a board or you might want a, um, a boom, a boom arm. Right. It's like, Oh yeah, I need one of those. I need one of those. And boop, 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 it goes all of a sudden, instead of a $75 order, it's a $300 order, right? We've all seen that. So, you know, it just, you got to be stewards of your money. You got to open your consciousness and be, you know, eyes wide open on this stuff. When you got that credit card out, it's like, it's so much easier today with a damn credit card than if you had $300 in your hand and you're like, okay, this has got to get me through the month, my groceries and other things. And um, I have to be a steward with it because you got those pennies and the nickels and the dollars in your hands. But when you got a credit card, man, it's just like, it's like paper. It's like play money. People don't realize yeah. um, the, the dynamics, the dynamics going on mentally with these marketers and stuff. They, they will take your money. So we have to be stewards of that. Yeah. So, so Tim, you, you know, you talked about online and everything. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, over the last two years, um, you know, a lot of the, advantages that that we have as as a as a firm is by leveraging you know technology uh and and it got accelerated over the last two years so so trishel with that in mind what's it been like for you where uh you know people have become more comfortable doing you know virtual meetings right i mean we're, we're doing a podcast right now you're in florida tim's in idaho i'm in phoenix right um and it's real easy to be able to communicate now across you know across the country and everything so have you seen an acceleration over the last two years with your clients that you're able to work with just because of the comfort level of being online uh, yeah i'd say absolutely you know i started the business before the pandemic as a virtual only business and it's only helped having the notion that hey you don't gotta leave your house you're already working from home and we don't have to worry about wearing masks, right? And at the same time, we can have this meeting when it's convenient for you and me, and then you can go right back to work or right back to doing what's more important to you instead of wasting half of your time jumping to get on the other side of town to meet me and then run back to your meeting, right? So it's only helped. And frankly, I do also speak with other clients that are or prospects that are older and they've jumped on it too you know 50s 60s my oldest client is in her 70s no big issue yeah so um it, it's interesting that i have i've actually been arguing for for quite some time now that um you know the the older generation which is primarily a lot of the advisors that we work with that's who they're working with you know their their average age probably is 70 of their clientele that they're working with right um, and, and I think it's accelerated for them. And, and as I, as I share these different types of, you know, digital transformation ideas and, and leveraging technology with what we've done, you know, at, at Epic and, um, and my other company, CSI financial group, those clients have really been forced to have to become comfortable online, right? Whether they liked it or not, uh, that, that is, um, you know, to your point, you know, you've got a 70 year, your oldest client instead of 70. That is sort of like, in their mind, like the just the way things were going already. What happened with in the last two years is just an acceleration of that. Is that fair? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, it, it's it's happened all over the place where a lot of jobs maybe they're not coming back to work anymore. Maybe that office isn't going to reopen again. Maybe you know that catalyst to realize that it it is kind of efficient to have people 
work from home rather than spend two hours a day commuting. So th there's a lot of synergies to be had all over the place. Or if you're in California, yeah. maybe four to six hours commuting. Sure. Like my one of my mentors, his son, I think, commutes like two, three hours each way. That's yeah. freaking ridiculous, dude. Right. Yeah. That is crazy. That's not I, I, I said, you better turn your car into a mobile classroom and become the smartest person on the planet if you're in the car that darn much. Mm -hmm. But anyway. We got to take a quick break, yep. guys. So we'll wrap it up and we'll um, we'll take a break. And then when we come back, we'll flip the script and let Trish will ask me anything he wants about health. We'll be right back. You want the absolute best for yourself and you want it to be easy. That's why we created Green 85. It helps with detoxifying the body gently we're proud it's chemical free unlike almost all other supplements you'll find bottom line green 85 will get you healthier we look forward to hearing what green 85 did for you to get this product and our other amazing products go to chemicalfreebody.com that's chemicalfreebody.com What's up in Richards? Tim James here with my co-host Carter Wilcoxon. Again, today in the house, we've got Trishel Patel. I think in segment two, Trishel, I have to apologize. I think I keep calling. I want to call you your last name. So if I did that, it's okay. I have some You're people good. call me James. I was on the baseball team. Like, James, get over here. James, Tim, Timmy, TJ. I had a lot of names, but um, I think a lot of us, if I was in trouble, it was Timothy Warren James. That's what my mom called me when I was in big trouble. So now is the part of the episode where we get to flip the script, brother. So um, any questions you have about health for yourself, family member, a hypothetical person, uh, public health, what do you got? Yeah, you know, something has been going through my mind, and you've probably heard some of these concerns as well. But the notion is, what's going on with all the microplastics? Because I hear that these little particles, they're getting all over the place. You pick up any random cup of seawater, there's probably little bits of plastic in there. And then I heard recently that, hey, this stuff is getting in our food supplies and obviously it doesn't go away, it's plastic. And yeah. I, I just really heard recently, hey, this is even able to cross like the blood brain barrier and it's never gonna leave. And uh, is this like the next, you know, smoking of our generation? Well, it's already here. And, and it's our, I, I can emphatically tell you that all three of us on this call have it in our bloodstream. We have it in our fat and our muscle tissue. I just have less because I've had a, a lot more awareness around it. Uh, well, that's what we're about. My, my parent company is called chemicalfreebody.com. We're all about helping people give them the awareness and tools and then educate them so that then they can take action to you know, learn about this stuff. So um, you just bring up something that's really near and dear to me. So it was really funny because we were, um, we're putting a new section on the website. It's going to be, um, I should pull it up. I can't remember if I have the exact, it's in here to CFB projects. Um, I have it right here. So we are making, um, we have this thing called, uh, recommended products, right? These are other companies that we believe in. So besides our products, they're things that I use in my personal life. Our coaches use, we're going to create this, um, section called shocking educational videos and we're going to start putting some so all these videos that i've watched we use these to help um, somebody that's been aware to then go oh my god and then how do you tell your friend or your spouse about it without them thinking you're crazy or pushing them away or you know in documentaries that are very well done is good so you can hey, hey let's have movie night and then one night you watch what they're watching and then the next week you watch what you want and then you drop one of these movies on one of them is called tapped and that movie is, we're going to put that one in there under water pollution. And Tapped talks about plastics and how bad plastics are in the environment and stuff like that. Um, we've talked about it before. There's this thing called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's a large, almost like a landmass full of floating plastic out in the Pacific Ocean. It's about the size of Texas. It's huge, all right? And sh uh, ships have to plot courses or to go around it. Well, those plastics with the sun hitting it all the time, are breaking down into microplastics, just that component. There's a beach in Mexico that's half sand, half plastic sand. If you look at this is in this documentary, you have to watch it. T a p p e d tapped. So watch that, and and the you know it's blue and yellow and pink and all the different because the 
all the all the plastic bottles keep washing up on the shore. I mean, even in like uh what was that movie with Tom Hanks where he was uh shipwrecked or whatever or he cast away. Cast away. Yeah, yep. well where did that freaking ball come from and stuff? From the wreck, right? And plastics and he was using that kind of stuff. This is this is happening on the beaches all over all the continents and all the islands because it's so pervasive. Now, let's take it down to a micro level, which you brought up. When you buy um, clothing that is made from, that's not natural, so which means it's synthetic. These are all coming from crude oil. And then with crude oil, they use thousands of chemicals to make them into plastics, like little nylons, microfibers, um, these types of things. Um, you know, I did this when I was playing sports. I was like really pumped up because they had um, these, you know, Under Armour deals and Nike dry fit, which was really awesome because we could get off those big, heavy, you know, um, those cotton long sleeve shirts that you'd get all sweaty and you'd be soaked and kind of weighed down. These things would anti perspire and wick away the perspiration while you're played so you could stay loose and nimble. It was really cool. But there's a price to pay and there's a big price and it's just not worth it because there's new technology coming in now with natural fibers that's actually um, beats like Nike's dry fit anti wicking property. So here's this. Here's the sum of it. When you put on a, uh, when you adorn yourself with clothing, especially in high hormonal areas like the breast for women and down in the groin area for w women and men, you are, the, these, these toxic uh, clothings are off gassing estrogen mimicking chemicals directly into your bloodstream. And even after a thousand washes, they're still off gassing 97%. So it's literally gassing you um, when you wear these things. And then when your body, is a you know it's a electrical factory basically and that's how we put off 98.6 degrees and you're warming them up and you're off gassing okay we get that now when you wash these suckers in the washing machine these microplastics are coming off and where do they go well they part of the shirt then goes out into um back into the ecosystem right it goes down the drain and out of the house and back out it goes and then it's this has been happening for so long now there's so you know billions of people that are putting on synthetic clothing that these microplastics have accumulated so much so that 1500 miles into the interior into pristine lakes both the two and two and a half inch fish now have male and female organs they've turned into hermaphrodites because of the estrogen mimickers from microplastics microplastics and plastics in general that's why you never want to drink out of a plastic bottle um unless you know you're suicidal once you get this uh, awareness, you might not know about it because I didn't. I drank out of plastic for years. I wasn't suicidal, but I was I was because I didn't know. Right. I just didn't know. So knowledge is really powerful, but then you have to act on it. So this the rivers, the lakes, the tributaries, the little fishies and these amphibians are now turning into hermaphrodites, basically. Right. And the same thing's happening in society. It's disrupting our hormonal balance. How many women that are listening today have thyroid issues? breast cancer, ovarian cysts, uterine cysts, and guys, we've got prostate issues and man boobs. This is all directly linked to these microplastics. It's part of the problem. Anything that is an estrogen mimicker, right? So yeah, it's a problem. It's already here. They're doing umbilical cord tests now, and they've been doing them. I've seen them since 2005. I always tell people type in these three words, umbilical cord chemical into your browser, umbilical cord chemical, and you'll see the same test. And they're showing there's, there's, there's over 212 chemicals in the umbilical cord blood of newborns that are disrupting uh, their their mental development. And 180 of those chemicals cause cancer in humans. We are born polluted. And the older you are, the more time you've had to breathe in the air, right? That has, you know, if you, if you just painted your house, let's say you just painted, you have a baby on the way. You go in and you paint the baby's room. It's blue. If it's a boy, it's girl. It's pink. You know, you do that thing and it's all dialed in. Well, guess what? That paint will be off gassing these estrogen mimickers into that baby's bloodstream for four and a half years in that room. That's what's going to happen. And then by the kid gets older, you're going to probably paint the room again because he doesn't want that color anymore. And then you're going to give him another four and a half years of pollution every, and we, we do about 20,000 breaths a day. So, and just because you can't see these microscopic invaders, doesn't mean they don't go down your airway and attach to the mucous membrane in your throat and work their way into your digestive tract. And, into, and and then into your bloodstream. So yeah, it's a big problem. Jet fuel, automobile fumes, uh, rubber compounds off of tires. Where does your? How come your tires are bald? Well, you've driven sixty thousand miles. Where did all the rubber go? It spun off friction on the pavement and in, in the concrete, and it's went up into the air, and we breathed it in. Again, it attaches to the mucous membrane in the back of our throat, down into our system, into the blood, and it doesn't leave. Right? It just doesn't leave. Now it does leave a little bit when we 
when we, there, you know, we have urinate, we have urination, defecation, perspiration, respiration. And for women, we have the fifth pathway menstruation, which I believe is one of the reasons women live a little longer than men because they have that fifth, fifth way of elimination. But we need to learn about this stuff and then do things to, you know, number one, stop putting it in. So in this case, stop buying freaking clothing that's not natural fiber. If it's not 100% organic natural fiber, you're putting you're putting chemicals in your body because even if you go buy 100% cotton, cotton's like the second most sprayed crop in the world. So you're going to get the crude oil to make a pesticide to spray the cotton to keep the bugs off of it because the, the soil's been weakened because soil degradation. They haven't taken care of the soil. They haven't been good stewards of the soil because the soil's weak. The cotton's weak. So they got to spray it a whole bunch of times to keep the bugs off. If they just worked on the soil, the root of the problem literally had strong soil, they'd have a strong cotton and you wouldn't have any pests and, and it wouldn't be a big problem. So chemical, synthetic, plastic, um, nylons, microfibers, polyesters, all these things, lycras, women, you're wearing those lycra bras, you're off-gassing into your breasts. And the larger the breast, the they actually put the wire underneath it. There's uh, studies showed that the larger the breast the more this is causing cancer because two things are happening. Those bras are squeezing the breast and they're not allowed to move. And that's part of the lymphatic system. You got to pump the lymph and the breast is part of a very high hormonal area. And you're not moving your breasts around from walking, running and doing that kind of stuff. And you're trapping them and they're sitting there. Uh, this lycra bra is off gassing 24 seven into the breast, just as an example. And guys, the same thing when you're wearing your little, you know, your little tidy whiteies could be cotton, but Hanes cotton, but it's pesticide. And it's just sitting there gassing these pesticides into you. You can't see them. So nobody thinks about it, right? It's just kind of like, oh, hey, the um, nobody thinks about this stuff, right? They just they just don't think about it. But that's what's happening today, dude. It's a huge problem. And that's why we're big proponents of getting awareness, getting educated. Stop buying it. Only buy 100% naturally occurring uh, uh, organic fibers. Get rid. I would say burn your bras, ladies, but that would cause a bunch of chemicals in there, so don't do it. Just get rid of them, <laughs> and um, you know, um, and then um, and learn what you can do to get it out. You know, purifying your water, making sure you have an air purification system in your home, cracking your windows all day, getting fresh air coming in and out. Um, again, air purification, water purification systems. Um, you know, um, and then taking certain supplements to detox and get these chemicals out of your body moving your body, sweating, taking infrared saunas on a daily basis. We're big proponents of that. You know, we have all that stuff on our website now. We've got air purification systems. We've got saunas. The water purifiers are on their way. We're working on those right now. We have the, the detox products. All that stuff's there, and the education's there um, uh, to help people just bring the awareness because if they don't have the awareness, it's they're kind of screwed. You know, you just don't, you don't know what you don't know. And um, when you find out about this stuff, it's like, how soon do you want to know about it? Like right now, like it's just like investing. When's the best time to invest right now? Don't wait. If you haven't done it yet, do it right now. It's the same thing with your health and these toxic microplastics are really, um, are really screwing us up as a human race. We're really de-evolving and we're not just destroying us. We're destroying the entire ecosystem of these, these no seam plastics. It's a big problem. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Well, well, hopefully that answered the question though. Right. Yeah, speechless. Do you have any other questions, <laughs> yeah. Trishul? Well, you know, just tipping on that, are we, are we starting to see concerns with life expectancy? And um, you mentioned cancer rates, but are we starting to see some some dipping in like all-cause mortality and stuff like that relating to microplastics? Well, I don't know if there's any specific research that I've read directly linked to it, but you don't you don't even need it. You just need common sense. Yeah. It's just at this point, people just need to use a little bit of common sense because unfortunately, um, science has become the oldest profession. It's pay to play science. Now we're not basing things off the scientific method anymore. It's checkbook science. It's, you know, the, the people that are getting the grants or the, you know, uh, if I tried to get a grant for, you know, studying, uh, the dangers of vaccinations, I will get no money. But if I said, Hey, I want to study climate change, they'll throw money at me left and right. It's totally pay, pay to play. And what they'll do is they'll get some data, they bring some data in, and they'll hold that data, and they, they don't make it public. It should be put on a public server, and they hold it, and they manipulate it, manipulate it until they get the desired result they want. And then you have this scientific consensus 
Oh, the science is settled. You hear anybody saying the science is settled, they should be slapped. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Science is never settled. It's always changing. We'll always learn more things. Things are always open for discussion and open debate. And when they people start saying it's settled, don't sit down, you shut up, this is the way it is, you know that that is a major red flag. And we have some big problems today because, you know, academia uh, we have the, is basically – that's the, that's the center of all of our problems today. Harvard is the think tank, and MIT, these places are the think tanks for, for thought. And um, the only thing that's going to change that is, like, it's a bottoms-up working-class movement. We, you know, politicians are just the lackeys. You know, these are the, you know, I don't know. They're just, that's not where the real focus needs to be. Those people are, just, it's all just WWF wrestling to me. It's, it's, a, it's a big show. If you're watching news 24-7, listening to politicians, voting left or right, you're wasting your time. It's... It's working class people uniting and using common sense and things like microplastics. It's a big problem. How come that's not 24 seven on the news? There's they're not making any money talking about that. They're making money pushing jabs right now. That's what it is because the big pharma was burning down with single molecule drug manufacturers. So they had to move into vaccinations because it's growing at 17 percent a year. It's a good and you can't get sued thanks to the Kennedy's in the 1986 Vaccine Act. So you have to go through, you know, our own government to do that. So that's it's just a broken system. So until we the people wake up and take our power back, you know, we're going to be slaves. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where I started just learning about it maybe in the last couple of years. And then the more you learn about it, the more you realize it. And you, you just kind of see it in your life, you know, like how if you learn about something or like a new word, then you hear it more often, mm -hmm. the more you. So, you know, just looking around in, you know, just my day-to-day -day living, you, you just see it everywhere. Like, you know, have a little kid, they come home from school and everything's covered in glitter. Like that, that's not going away anytime soon. And, yeah. You know, like you mentioned. Right. With and then it was like Valentine's clothes. Day. And then what are they, what are they passing around school? A bunch of right. uh, candy with high fructose corn syrup in it. That's been made with genetically modified corn sprayed in Roundup, which go to my mom and dad's home and they got the TV on and, you know, couple times a day a attorney's commercial come on have you been exposed to roundup the main herbicide you know the herbicide from glyphosate um you may be entitled to compensation if you've developed lymphoma cancer yet at valentine's day and halloween um the teachers are not they probably they don't know they're happily passing this out parents so we're all doing it and then it has red dye number four blue dye five all this other crap those are cancer causers okay i did a whole expose on this on pause on the easter egg deal dying easter eggs with toxic cancer causing dyes and it's how is it legal how is it legal to put something into your child that causes cancer and again don't take my word for it umbilical cord chemical look up the studies there's well over 200 chemicals that cause cancer in in babies being born today and the older you are the more you have because you've had long longer for your body to suck them up <laughs> it's just the way it is so Okay, here here we are. Like we can't live in fear. Okay, that's what it is. We live in a polluted world. So now what are you going to do about it? So a guy like Trishol, I can tell you what he's going to do because he's he's an intelligent system. He's going to get educated and he's going to start taking measures. And he's he might listen to this podcast and take some notes. He's probably going to get himself a sauna. If he hasn't already, he'll purify his water. And he's probably going to get his air cleaned up and he'll do some detox stuff. And guess what? You will have first person experience and you will feel better. You know, you if you take and do those things that I just shared with you, I promise you in six months, you're going to you're going to feel about 10 years younger than you do right now. And you're probably already pretty healthy. Right. But you get these no CM toxic invaders out of your body. They are a huge body burden burden weighing down your immune system and your quality of life. And you just don't know, it, but you can't see them. And all I can tell you is I've been through the process. I've led over 600 people through it personally. And we have thousands of people following us now worldwide and people are getting their life back. And they've tried everything. And this is seems to be working pretty good for a lot of folks. And it's just common sense. You don't have to be a rocket scientist or an engineer to figure this stuff out. Well, you know, I, I definitely appreciate that, you know, the understanding that you bring to all this. It's one of those things where, you know, learning all this stuff and the more you know, the, the more you're able to actually make some action and change. Awesome. Well, Trishul, yeah. I really appreciate you coming on. Great questions. Um, I hope I made a dent. I think I did. I hope I hope the listeners out there uh, got something out of this because, again, you know, you can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have health, you don't got squat. Confucius said, a healthy man wants a thousand things. A sick man wants one. 
we know what that one thing is and it's good health. So let's, those, let's, let's, let's just put them all together. And that's what we got the health and wealth podcast for. Right. Right. Carter. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no doubt about it. So, um, Hey, and Richards, uh, thank you again for joining us for another episode of the health and wealth podcast. To be able to see all of our previous guests, make sure to go visit our website at www.thehealthandwealthpodcastshow.com. Uh, I want to thank our esteemed uh, and wonderful guest today, uh, Trishel Patel, CFP in, um, in Florida by way of New York. Thank you so much for joining us to, uh, today and uh, for my, uh, my wonderful co-host, Mr. Chemical Free Body himself. Make sure to go check out his website as well. But you can always check out all of our uh, connected entities there by uh, going to www.thehealthandwealthpodcastshow.com. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe as well wherever you get your podcast at uh, Apple, Google, or Spotify uh, as well. So, uh, Trisha, thank you so much for joining us. Dude, it was yeah, so brother. great to have you on here today. Oh, Thanks, Carter. Thanks, Dan. I enjoyed it. It was a great conversation. Absolutely. Pleasure is all ours. Until next time, and Richards, we will see you have an abundant day and an, abund uh, an abundant rest of your uh, week and life. And we will see you next time on the Health and Wealth Podcast Show. Thank you, everybody. Hey, and Richards, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Health and Wealth Podcast. I'm your host, Carter Wilcoxon. And I'm your host, Tim James. And by God, we are committed to helping you guys have fat wallets, flat bellies, so tune in again for another episode and make sure to like, share, and drink a lot of water. Or beer. You have just listened to the Health and Wealth Podcast with Carter and Tim.